I really, really like to make things. Um, I like to make uh, things in robotics. I like to make music. Music, um, oh, let's start with robotics. Um, this is a small movie clip. Um, this was a graduation project at the University of Twente. This was the first robot that I actually built that really, really, really came alive. It's the, the joy of creation, the joy of, of making things alive. It, it was already really starting there. Um, normally, I make music on bass guitar or keys. Um, and these two can go pretty well together also with robotics. Um, for instance, in uh, this project of mine, uh, together with a colleague, uh, a creative artist, we built a piano mobile. Uh, digital, or actually, it's an electrical moving platform with a digital piano on top. It got the obligatory lampshade, uh, candles, uh, Beethoven statue, and female singer in long dress. And it's been, well, it came from the frustration as a street musician that, well, you play piano and you want to play on the street. They don't go together. So that's, that's why um, we came up with this, this weird machine. I, I like to make things um, alive, or to make inanimate things come uh, to life, such as this one, uh, which has already been invented by, by Pixar as a movie clip. But yes, to make a thing really, really alive, that's great. So the most uh, uh, challenging project up to now came uh, a couple of years ago when I was asked to copy a human being. Um, an artist, uh, Leonard van Munster, uh, approached me uh, and he said, well, I'm terrible at dancing, uh, especially uh, at a salsa club or at reggae music. I'm really, really terrible. I have this, this slightly uncomfortable sort of moves that normally white men have when entering uh, a dance floor like that. So um, he asked me to uh, create for him the dancing white man a uh, fully operational dancing replica of himself. And for me, as a roboticist, that's of course the, 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 the optimal goal, the, the real project to strive for, copy a human being. Um, it, it looks like, uh, like this right now, ah, like this. So you can hopefully not tell which is which, or, well, I can... Good. The one with the slight glassy look, of course, that's the robot. Uh, it's right now uh, as a, a, a statue present in um, uh, the city Schouwburg, or Stad Schouwburg, uh, so the city theater of Amsterdam, uh, where it dances, but it will only start to dance if you're starting to dance in front of him. So uh, if you just go and visit, it will slightly blink its eyes or move its head if you're lucky, lucky enough. Um, but normally, it's only start to dance if you start dancing really frantically in front of him. Uh, and then will it uh, will yank out, will switch the, the music, the terrible Phil Collins that's normally playing there in the bar, and it will put some reggae music on and do, uh, do his moves. OK, so these kind of projects that I really like, of course, I also build or try to build useful robots. At Twente University, I'm currently trying to develop a robot that's capable of inspecting gas pipes. And fortunately, at the same university, uh, I'm allowed to teach future generations of students on uh, creation and on, on creative design. Um, they started a new program called Creative Technology. It's a brand new program to try to educate the engineers that we need in the future, especially for this whole creative sector that we're currently living in. Okay. The story that I want to talk about um, it uh, starts roughly uh, five years ago when I fall in love or fell in love with a machine. Uh, this machine, to be particular, it's a laser cutter. And this is a machine. Um, okay, uh, accidentally, at the same time, I also uh, fell in love with a beautiful, uh, beautiful woman, and uh, we had a beautiful son together. So that, that's, let's let's not mix about, of course. I'm, I'm okay, but I really, really, really fell in love with this machine. It's a production machine, a laser cutter. Um, it can basically cut out with high precision. It can burn away bits of material in plastic, in wood, in leather, whatever kind of material, and make very nice and very precise parts. Uh, apparently, this machine was, had something um, to, well, it, did, uh, um, it filled the void, so to say. Apparently, I had a need for a machine where I could push the button, and this machine would produce whatever I wanted it to produce. Um, okay, so I started toying around with this machine, and I found out that, um, well, one of the nice things is that you have to translate 
things from flat pieces of matter, uh, that you have to have or use certain tricks in order to create 3D shapes. Um, this is, for instance, it's, it's really a hot topic right now. This is a copy, copy this from Make Magazine, the latest issue, which basically um, has the, an article on the age-old art of joinery, how to make connections in wood, and translated or transferred those skills to, or apply those skills to, this laser cutter. So apparently there are a lot of people that are currently working on uh, designing things, then flatten them, let them cut out on a laser, and then producing them. Um, it's a really nice way of produce, producing things, since um, a drawing of the parts is also the design file itself. So it allows for designs to be very open and very easy to transfer between places. Like, I make a drawing, basically this drawing is all the parts that you need for something. So that idea got me sort of thinking. Like, apparently, in order to get really creative and to be able to make really nice 3D things, um, you can really do with this, this severe limitation of, of having to, um, to, well, translate everything to a flat drawing. So apparently, these kind of restrictions can lead to creativity, or, or to say it more broadly, boundaries really enforce creativity. So it's not so much as the outside of the box thinking, it's more like, well, you design a good box and start do the thinking or the designing from, from within. So it's basically inside the box thinking that can lead to some, well, brilliant forms of creativity, I must say. So then the next question was, OK, okay where to go now? Because I like it very much, so what to, de what to design? Um, and am I the only one? This is a crazy project. From a roboticist point of view, um, this is purely nuts. Nobody ever asked a roboticist to, well, design a robot, but uh, be restricted to PVC tubes only. It is silliness. However, it, it led to the beautiful beach-crawling statues, the beach-crawling machines by Theo Janssen, also a big dead laureate. So, um, apparently, a weird sort of restriction, a weird sort of box, can uh, work as a great uh, creative stimulant. Now, where to go from there with my robots? Um, I formulated a very simple assignment, a very simple competition or contest. Who can design the coolest robot using just one A4 sheet of plywood or plastic? Just one A4 sheet of material for all the mechanical parts. So here in this movie you see the laser cutter working on some wooden parts um, that are later being used for a robot. And the, the fun part is, it is really nice and really fun to um, work with a challenge like that. As you see, uh, a small spidery robot there in the uh, bottom left corner, um, bottom right corner. And all the parts, all the mechanical parts you need for this robot are made in one A4 sheet of plastic. OK. Where did I find this laser cutter? Because at the time, uh, falling in love with this machine, I had not access to this machine. I found one uh, in a fab lab. You heard about a fab lab, a fab lab a laboratory for digital fabrication. And at the time, there was a great lab in Utrecht. It's called Protospace. Um, the nice part uh, on how fab labs work right now is, um, well, they require a certain openness. Well, you can use uh, FabLab for your own means. They basically charge you either for your ideas or your money. So you, s you simply pay, then you can use the equipment and no questions asked. But if you want to use the equipment for free, then normally you have to give the design files. So I left the design files of this weird uh, thing that I will show you. I left them at the machine there at Protospace. Um, in the weeks after that, they started turning up uh, on many places uh, at the world, apparently. Um, here you see the, the creatures that, that I, I made. They were tiny walking robots. It even get, got me, it gets more scary if you heard a tune with it.
So basically, I am now the one holding the remote control for this whole army of tiny robots that innocent children are currently producing somewhere in fab labs all over the world. Okay, so you know. Um, good. So this fab lab is, is a great phenomena and a great way of uh, having access or gaining access to new ideas, to new ways of producing things. Um, and there are quite a number already worldwide, as Thomas uh, before me already explained. And especially in the Netherlands, there's a great number of fab labs already there. Um, and I set out to set up just another one. Around the same time as I was uh, toying around with designs on laser cutters and uh, uh, building a lot of robots that will take over the world one day, um, I was also meeting um, with a special group of people. I encountered them uh, at uh, some of the creative factories or uh, creative places. Um, and basically, there is a special category of people that are currently uh, weird enough or strange enough uh, sort of left out. There are a lot of people currently uh, having completed uh, an educational uh, education on a technical level, uh, even at bachelor or master level. And a lot of them are currently sitting at home unemployed because of a so-called autism spectrum disorder. So basically, they have somewhere uh, uh, an issue related to autism, and that is sort of keeping them from having a normal employed life. Um, there's this sort of relation that you could sort of already hunch on your gut feeling, like there is a relation between really technical-minded people and autism, or really technical-minded people, geeks, like real... Okay, so I'm not a sociologist, so that's really thin ice for me, but uh, this, this article, I think it's on 2011 in Nature, it sort of shook up the world with this connection in the whole technical areas of our country, like the Eindhoven area or the Twente region, where a lot of people live with autism-related uh, issues. And also, of course, there are the booming places for technology. Now, I'm still on thin ice. Um, what you see in, um, in our society right now is that instead of the tradition, uh, traditional engineering skills, uh, people, in order to operate or to work in a company, you need to be able to sell yourself. You need to be able to do a lot of teamwork. You need to do personal branding. Uh, you need to multitask, work on multiple projects at the same time. You need to communicate, especially with human resource uh, uh, managers. Um, <laughs> and these, these kind of skills are um, not the typical skills for people with autism-related uh, issues, um, especially not when they are surrounded by us uh, being the neurotypicals, according to their words. Um, uh, so, so normally, these kind of uh, 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 points that you really need right now in this society are sort of keeping them from, uh, well, sometimes even just from employment. So you need, on the other hand, people with certain skills and people with certain determination to get projects done, to get work done. So um, one of the challenges, or one of the things that I found out, together with uh, Michel ten Buren, he is a social psychiatric nurse, so to, that's the term, um, we started up a workshop. We started up basically a fab lab, specially tailored at people with autumn spectrum issues or autumn spectrum. Uh, spectrum disorders, and um, we tried in this workshop to appeal to well the projects or the things that I really like, and technology is one of the one of the favorite things among them. So this Fab Lab, as a format, with the state of the art in producing machines, in laser cutters, 3D printers, etc., was a really great motivational thing to offer to this category of people. So we started without. Uh, additional funding, uh, just on our own, we started basically a sort of bottom-up fab lab. Um, and one of the real, real important side effects or benefits of this uh, is this social inclusion part. Just getting out of your house, getting out from the couch, and with your personal interests and goals, and find a place where you find other people with the same issues, and then just start to work, start to play, is really, really motivational. Um, we started 
um, basically in uh, this um, pretty pretty nice location. It's one of the cultural hotspots of Enschede, uh, the Rome Bay Quarter. <laughs> I'm sorry for that pun, but basically the, the, this, these windows, they have this, this very clear view of a very nice green valley with a car park in front of it. Um, <laughs> as FabLab goes, our, our one is uh, pretty, pretty clean, actually. Um, you uh, the, the, the pictures Thomas just showed with a lot of clutter, a lot of things. So that has to do something with the group that we're targeting in, uh, in this lab, or the group that's been using it up to now. Um, the funny thing is, the kind of things that we do, we make uh, products or um, offer workshops, which is a whole sort of challenge in its own. While uh, you have a group that normally have problems with the whole social things, uh, with, with teaching, with communication, and we use this group to give workshops to children with the robots that they design on their own laser cutter. And it works, it, it really works. Um, so even we got without funding, but um, by asking uh, simple companies, what can you give us? We have a nice initiative. Uh, if you have something you can offer in terms of uh, equipment, in terms of waste material, whatever, give it to us, and, and we uh, have a nice group that can, uh, can work with it. So even this beloved machine, this love of my life in a technical sense, arrived last February. So imagine the joy of having access to one of those machines in my own lab. Um, and it's really it's nice to see these machines do work, and it's even nicer to see uh, people that, that uh, well, we help in this way, uh, getting up to scratch with technology, getting to know the software packages they have to use for, for making design drawings, creating their own things, uh, having their pet projects, uh, and, 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 and use them in our lab to make things. So I would like to conclude this uh, talk with this. Uh, inside the box, well, outside the box thinking, box design that's being laser cut by some people with autism, autism related issues in our uh, uh, fab lab, our fabrication uh, lab. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>